Well, hello, my name is Susan Elliott, and I'm the president and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And I'd like to welcome all our friends and colleagues from around the world uh, to today's program, Moscow in Focus, Perspective on the US-Russia Relations. We think that this is a really a good time given the newness of the Biden administration and the activities and situation uh, going on between uh, US and Russia, that it was a good idea to bring experts together to give their perspectives on uh, the future of our relationship, what's happening and what we think will happen. So I am going to introduce our panelists and then I'll turn it over to our today's moderator, uh, Tom Graham, to lead the discussion. But just a few housekeeping issues is that if you want to ask a question, you can go to the bottom of your screen and uh, type your question into the Q&A uh, portion of the, um, the Zoom meeting. And we will do our best to address as many of the questions as we can toward the end of the program. I also would like to tell you that this is on the record and being recorded. Uh, so anyway, uh, thanks again to all of you for being here. I'll first start with uh, our first panelist, uh, Fiona Hill, who is the Robert Bosch Senior Fellow in the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institute. Um, she served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European and Russian Affairs at the National Security Council from 2017 to 2019. Before that, she served as a National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council. We also have Ambassador John Teft, who is a retired career foreign service officer serving for more than 45 years at the US Department of State, still alive to talk about it. He served as the US ambassador to Russia from 2014 to 2017, and earlier served as US ambassador to Lithuania, Georgia, and Ukraine. So he knows the region very well, and he's now a senior fellow at Rand Corporation. And our moderator for today's discussion is Tom Graham. He's a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's also currently a senior advisor at Kissinger Associates, where he focuses on Russian and Eurasian affairs. He's the co-founder of the Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies Program at Yale University, and he sits on its faculty steering committee. He's also a research fellow at the Macmillan Center at Yale and teaches a course on US-Russia relations there. Uh, Tom also had a distinguished career in the U.S. Foreign Service. He was Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Russia at the National Security Council from 2004 to 2007. And at that time, he managed White House Kremlin Strategic Dialogue. He was also Director of Russian Affairs before that. So as you all can see, we've got a fantastic panel here to discuss uh, U.S.-Russia relations. So I'll now turn the program over to Tom. And thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, Susan, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you to the National Committee for organizing this event today. Uh, you know, as Susan has indicated, we've had an eventful period in U.S.-Russian relations since the Biden administration took over in January. Uh, we've had uh, Navalny's return to Russia, his arrest. We've had a series of sanctions and counter sanctions levied by the United States and Russia, expulsions of diplomats uh, with recalls of ambassadors, uh, more recently the, uh, the events surrounding Ukraine, and mixed into all of this. Uh, a proposal by President Biden that the two leaders meet uh, sometime in the near future uh, to sort out this relationship uh, and come to some understanding of how we might manage it going forward. Uh, so I would like to begin the discussion today by taking a step back from the current uh, affairs, which we can get to in the question and answer period, uh, and pose some questions about the broader context uh, of U.S.-Russian relations. Uh, and I'd like to start with you, John, uh, and by asking you to give us a sort of a succinct description of the Russia challenge uh, that we face today here in the United States. Is this simply something that is an accumulation of specific differences uh, over the past few years, rivalries in some ways, or there's something more fundamental at play, uh, uh, opposing worldviews, uh, very different, radically different views of the roles that each country should play in global affairs. Uh, 
John, I think you're muted. Okay. I, I hit it. Okay, good. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thanks, Susan, for inviting me to join, uh, to join this panel. I'm uh, happy to be with you all. And I think you've asked a, a big question to start, Tom, but let me give it a shot. Uh, I think that what we're facing fundamentally is a, is a very pronounced uh, difference of views. And this isn't just this, this goes back a number of years. Um, America and Russia's interests have been defined very, very differently. I think particularly on the Russian side, things have evolved under uh, Putin in his fourth term as president to become a much more adversarial uh, kind of relationship. Um, Fiona is the expert on this, but I think we've seen Putin evolve for his 20 years in power from a leader who was prepared to really work with Western nations to someone who's now become really an out and out opponent of the Western liberal system. So it's more than just the individual issues that uh, we uh, have differences with Putin and Russia. It's uh, become uh, a fundamental uh, difference of views over the very kind of uh, world order that we should really have. Uh, we've seen, just to mention a couple of examples, we've seen him now uh, aggressively uh, resist what he sees as American and European dominance of the world economy. He's increasingly tried to shut out Western influence inside Russia. Uh, his best friend has become Xi Jinping of China. Um, in Europe, since the 2014 invasion of Ukraine, uh, Russia has become not a participant as it was for decades in trying to build a, an international security order, but really as a, a destabilizing regional threat. Uh, we saw that recently in the military buildup uh, near Ukraine and in the Black Sea. Um, and in fact, uh, the 2014 invasion really tore up decades of agreements, uh, which Russia itself had helped negotiate in order to try to create a stable European security regime. Admittedly, one that, uh, that, they, that they liked, but now uh, they're not a part of that at all. Now, of course, fundamentally, they're still an existential threat to us. Uh, they're strategic. Uh, weapons and intermediate weapon, weapons are a threat to us and our West European allies and our European and Asian allies. And they, of course, have, uh, have modernized their weapon systems. Uh, they've got better space weapons, better nuclear systems, and, of course, uh, a tremendous cyber capability, which, along with its propaganda arm, has given it the, these hybrid capabilities which have threatened us and our uh, European allies. So it's a formidable set of challenges that... Uh, that Russia now faces, and but at the root of it is this fundamental difference of view about what the world order should look like, what Russia's role would be within a Western liberal order. Um, anyway, perhaps I'll stop at that point and we can go on. Uh, thank you, John. I, you know, I'd like to pose the same question to you, Fiona, but put it in a slightly different context. And you know, if you look at the history of U.S.-Russian relations say, over the past 125 years from the moment the United States emerged as a great power at the very end of the 19th century, you know, one could argue that there's very little that's in, uh, encouraging about uh, in the, the chances for improved relations between our two countries. Uh, you know, we were competitors in Northeast Asia and Europe uh, and we, uh, for many, many decades. Uh, we had complaints about the uh, despotic regime in Russia uh, starting back in the late uh, 19th century and amplified during the, the Soviet period. And even if you look at the period uh, that many cite as a, sort of the height of US-Russian cooperation during the Second World War, I think if you look at it more closely, you'll see that uh, the United States and Russia didn't so much fight together as they fought in parallel on two different, two different fronts. And the relationship was laced uh, with deep suspicions that led uh, to, the, to the outbreak of the Cold War once peace had been uh, concluded uh, in Europe at that time. And so the question I have is uh, what we see is what we see today uh, in, in US Russian relations really more of a simply a variation uh, on the relationship over the past 125 years? Or is there something new uh, that leads a distinctly different character to the relationship and the nature of the challenges that we face today? 
Well, I think that's a great uh, summary, Tom. And you know the way that you've laid it out, I think, really illustrates exactly the problem that we're dealing with, and that you know Ambassador Teft was uh, was also grappling with, you know, in response to the first question. I mean, you missed out actually a few things that you could have, have added in there that would have, I think, darkened the picture from the perspective of Russia even more, including, for example, the intervention that Russians often cite of uh, US troops immediately after the Bolshevik revolution that was in the Russian Far East um, and the kind of Pacific coastline. Um, you know, we sent in an expeditionary force, uh, you know, essentially to try, as many others were thinking uh, of trying to do to kind of roll back uh, the the revolution um, in uh, that early part of the 20th century too, so you know when you do look at it in that way, and that's actually a reading of, of the Russians' reading of that um, evolution of the history of relations uh, between the two. There's nothing much uh, that is um, uh, particularly positive uh, to put on the ledger, apart from as you're saying uh, a, a wartime alliance that was also an alliance of um, exigency and expediency and necessity. And wasn't something that was, um, you know, kind of even initially envisaged at the very beginning, because, of course, the Soviet Union at one point was very much on the different side of, uh, of World War Two until uh, the Nazi uh, invasion. We do, however, have um, a shared um, exploration of the Americas. And of course, you know, we have uh, the purchase by the United States of Alaska that had been uh, a Russian frontier outpost. And the Russians were, in fact, competing uh, with the European powers for their exploration of uh, the US Pacific coast. We do actually have a lot of artifacts of um, Russian heritage. Fort Ross in California, um, the uh, establishment of a number of outposts of the Russian Orthodox Church, monasteries and the like, and Russian populations extending down from Alaska through into California. So one could say we have a shared heritage in the Americas from that early um, European explorations. But that, again, is probably not something uh, that we can really base a lot on. I think that that gives us, you know, uh, a picture of how hard it's going to be to try to turn that relationship around in the future. And the new dimensions that you're talking about um, that add to this that you were alluding to in the question are where I think we have the largest problems and it's what Ambassador Teff was already laying out there. We don't have a great deal of shared heritage. We don't have a great deal of shared positive history. We have more of a kind of a, a long period of enmity in which the Russians considered it uh, that is continuing in the form of some kind of new Cold War, a new sort of structural confrontation. And we now have new dimensions to this because we're in different domains. This is not just a question of kind of territorial divisions. I mean, we, the United States are actually not interested in dividing up Europe as we you know, were during the Cold War. But we now have space and cyberspace and uh, all other dimensions here where the Russians sort of see the transference of that long history of rivalry and competition in some form. So the, the uh, points that Ambassador Teft has made about you know, where we are today, when Russia is in fact uh, seeming constantly to be in the business of intrusions into um, our cyber uh, infrastructure, uh, the uh, solar winds hack, you know, kind of speculation that Russia may be not just the kind of ransomware, you know, is also um, putting our pipeline and other energy infrastructure at risk. I mean, we've got the ongoing problem of ransomware and, you know, sometimes people are worried that Russia's behind that as well, that we're just sort of fighting this out on so many different dimensions now. We can't seem to get ourselves out of that confrontational perspective. So what do we do? And I think that's kind of where we have to start thinking about, is there some way of changing this calculus, changing that history, finding some areas of uh, shared comity, of shared purpose and shared interest. The pandemic should have been that. And I think, you know, as we go on with this discussion, we might want to inspect why that hasn't been the case, because we have had periods where we've worked together on difficult issues. We did it out of necessity in World War II. We did it when we had to deal with polio. We did it when we had to deal with smallpox, for example, where we had an existential threat that we all shared in. And I would argue that we do have existential threats today. It's climate change and Russia is not inured to that. And it's not just going to be the case that, you know, Russian vineyards are going to be sprouting all up all over Siberia, as the New York Times suggested in one of its magazine features that the Russian river in California, the vineyards there will now be the Russian rivers in uh, Siberia, the Lena and the Ob will now be great vine culture, viticulture centers of the world, you know, as France and others uh, recede into the distance with, uh, with climate change. But we're not there yet. And in the meantime, we've got a lot to deal with. And the pandemic is part of this as well. So 
I would just say, you know, what has been thinking about this, is there some way of changing this trajectory from one that looks like historic competition to something where we might be able to see some kind of common purpose, but, you know, right now we're far from that. Okay, I, you know, that I think uh, is a good point, Fiona, that we'll get to a little bit later in the discussion. Uh, but I have a, a prior question to ask. Uh, I think one that we see uh, that's very widely in the, in the United States, Western media, uh, media in general, and that's the question of Putin. How much of a factor is Putin uh, in the character of the relationship we, we have at this point? Uh, and there are two related questions here. I mean, the first is, uh, to what extent does Putin have a free hand in making uh, foreign policy towards the United States, foreign policy in general? Uh, and the second is the question, to, to what extent is the uh, U.S.-Russian relationship or Russian foreign policy a reflection of Putin's personality, his character? To what extent is it a reflection of the regime that he leads? Uh, which is often described as a kleptocracy uh, in, uh, in the United States, or to what extent uh, is it a reflection of traditional Russian national interests uh, that may be being pursued in a somewhat distinctive fashion because of today's cir circumstances, but also find their roots uh, deep in Russian history. Uh, and Fiona, since you're the expert on Putin, maybe I'll start with you and, that, and then I'll go to John. Well, you know, actually, Tom, I think it's all of those things, because it, it, it is, of course, Vladimir Putin's own reading and the reading of the people around him of that history of relations, just, you know, the last discussion that we were involved in as well. It's like, how do you see things playing out with the United States, but how do you see the world in general? And Putin obviously has a very particular perspective on this. He is someone who was born in the 1950s, so he was basically born at the uh, you know, advent of the Cold War right after World War II. His whole viewpoint is shaped by that Cold War. And of course, he decides that his role you know, ahead um, or his pathway ahead, his career pathway ahead is through the KGB, through the security services. So he basically stalks the dark black co uh, corridors of the state to become the president. His pathway is, you know, not the usual one for a politician, although some of the skills that he learned as a KGB officer, he always notes are very useful as a, po a politician, you know, the whole way that he sort of seeks to manipulate people and turn them into assets, and he's very open uh, about you know, how he's applied the skills that he learned as a kind of case officer uh, to politics and to certainly targeting political opponents and, you know, world leaders to try to manipulate them or persuade them um, of, uh, you know, of certain courses of action. But the way that he reads the world is very much through that lens of the Cold War, that constant sense of being in confrontation and the idea that the world is out to get you. And, you know, he continues to believe that that's the case, continues to rail and push against the Cold War institutions, which, of course, you know, we have embraced as post-Cold War institutions, NATO and also the European Union, you know, which emerged um, in the same uh, time frame. And he does also tend to see things in us versus them uh, uh, camps, you know, basically. So it's the West versus the East still. And you alluded at the very beginning, Tom, obviously to the close relationship that's emerging with China. Um, this in, uh, in itself is also part of that uh, perspective that Putin brings to the table, that China was always in the, the Soviet camp. Um, it was often a dangerous and <laughs> difficult relationship, in fact, because they did clash in the 60s and 70s over the, the Amur River uh, territorial boundary. So the Soviet Union and Communist China weren't always on the same page, but the idea was that they were, you know, in many respects in the same block. And so Putin tends to see that as a kind of, it's not a natural relationship or a natural partnership, but it is natural to think that there would be some common purpose there, particularly in opposition to the United States. And so, so much of uh, the framing of Russian foreign policy is drawn from the framing of Soviet foreign policy in terms of alliances, in terms of, um, those are very loose of course, because Russia doesn't really sort of see itself as having formal allies, but in terms of the relationships that Putin has rekindled, be that with Venezuela or others in the Western hemisphere in Latin and South America, be that the reinvigoration of relationships in Southeast Asia with Vietnam and others that were obviously close partners during the Soviet period, being that a kind of return to Africa and to North Africa, picking up all partnerships and relationships uh, that the Soviet Union had. So again, it's that old frame because that's what Putin knows and it's what the people around him know. 
And so, I mean, that's a big question, as if there will be at some point some change in leadership as to whether that framework would change. And I think we saw some hints of that with Dmitry Medvedev. When Putin passed over the, premier, the presidency and took the premiership in that period between 2007 and 2011, and I think Ambassador Tefkin talked to that directly, there was a change in style and atmosphere and kind of a feeling and perspective because Medvedev was just a different person. He was a younger person and he had a different perspective. He'd been a lawyer. Um, okay, Vladimir Putin technically had been a lawyer too, but Vladimir Putin's whole perspective was shaped by the KGB. Medvedev's was not. And Medvedev had a sort of softer touch not entirely a different perspective, but a softer touch on the world stage. So we might you know, expect something different in the future. But Ambassador Teft, I mean, you had to interact with him, him directly in the time when you were in Moscow. So I'm, I'm sure you have some uh, other insights there too. Yeah, so we'll pass it on to you, John. Um, you know, you had to deal with, uh, with Putin, you had to deal with Russia. Uh, so I guess, you know, you could pose the question this way. I mean, to what extent do you think the, the major problem that we have with, with Putin and his regime and to what extent is it a broader Russia problem? And then following on what Fiona just posed, um, if Putin were to, to leave at some time in the not too distant future, or even sometime in the distant future, would the nature of the challenge we face from Russia change dramatically in your view? Well, thanks, Tom. I, uh, Fiona had a very good summary there. I agree with everything she said. Uh, I was thinking actually, as she was speaking, that uh, while Putin is really unchallenged in terms of foreign policy and by everybody's account, he loves to do that. He doesn't, uh, doesn't really like to do domestic policy very much, but uh, he has to because he has, he has no other choice. Um, you know, Putin is a man of the 1980s. His uh, views are rooted, as Fiona said, in the Cold War. And uh, I don't know, I've been thinking lately that uh, maybe as his policies, both foreign policies and domestic policies are implemented here in 2021, He's becoming even more uh, of a man of the of, of the 1980s with the uh, with the efforts to uh, <clears throat> to repress people at home and also to uh, basically has a bad relationship with almost everybody in Europe. Uh, only really with the Chinese is it uh, is it going uh, pretty well? And a lot of that is based on his relationship with Xi. Um, with regard to the you know he is a man of the of the of the Russian elites and a lot of the people who there he represents a, a more hard line group where he has sided with them in recent years. But you know what Fiona said, she mentioned Medvedev, but there's so many others among the Russian elites who have different views. And even when I was in Moscow from 2014 to 2017, you know, I could sit in private and talk to people. And you got a, a real sense of uh, uh, of difference uh, with Putin, and this is uh, this is now dated to a certain extent. But I suspect it's only uh, it's only uh, exa it's only become even worse. I mean, I, you would talk in private about uh, uh, worries that people had about the increasing isolation from the West, the declining Russian economy, failure to do economic reform, uh, failure to diversify the economy, even as the world is moving. Uh, to uh, uh, rely less on hydrocarbons, which is Russia's great, uh, great strength. The failure to understand nationalism emerging in Ukraine and Georgia and now in Belarus, changing attitudes of young people. You can go on and on. And I found people who I could talk to in private who were concerned very much about that. Now, none of us knows what will happen when Putin actually does uh, decide to leave the scene. Uh, I'm not sure I would put a lot of money on betting that he would still be there in uh, 2036 uh, or whatever the uh, the Constitution will now now allow him. But I think at some point we're we're going to have a change. It'll, if I had to guess, I'd say it'd be somebody similar to start. But things will be changed because a lot of the the younger people, not just uh, the people we see on the streets demonstrating, but young people coming up in the state institutions, coming up in the K in, in the uh, intelligence services, coming up in government, they will all have a say. And I think they see many of these problems that have developed with the Putin administration. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see some change. Now, I'm not going to say that we're going to have a Gorbachev come in here, uh, but uh, I think we will see some change over time. Uh, it's just hard to distinguish that now because Putin is so so powerful and uh, so dominant in their system. Yeah, can I stay with you for that for a moment? When you say change, what do you think sort of the range of possible change is, uh, you know, speaking to this younger generation? I think you're absolutely right. You know, we pay a lot of attention to Putin, 
uh, and when he will leave power. But Russia is on the cusp of a, uh, of a generational uh, shift in leadership. Uh, you know, Putin's generation uh, is eventually going to leave the scene. Uh, you're beginning to see younger people, certainly on the, on the economic side. One can imagine that they're uh, also moving up uh, in the special services and the military, although we don't see uh, uh, that much in, in public on that. So when you think about the range of possibilities that we might face uh, with a new Russian leader, how would, you, how would you sort of bracket that for us? Are we going to get someone who may be more nationalist, patriotic than Putin is? Mm -hmm. uh, or on the other side, are we going to get someone uh, a bit more reform-minded, liberal, who understands uh, that perhaps uh, improved <clears throat> relations with the West uh, is, is really Russia's, in Russia's future interest? That's a great question, Tom. If I had to guess, I would say we have somebody who would start out uh, uh, as close uh, to Putin, wrapped in Putin's uh, cloak as uh, much as possible, but uh, then have to come to grips with these uh, changes that uh, I think are going to be necessary, particularly in the economic sphere. I mean, Russia's uh, standards of living uh, have been basically flat for over a decade now. And uh, this contributes, I think, to not just uh, more liberal reformers wanting to have change, but I think to ordinary Russians saying, hey, come on, we're not, uh, not improving here. I think there's less appeal, at least that's my, my gut feel. I haven't been in Moscow for a long time, obviously because of the COVID uh, pandemic, but I think there's a lot of uh, people in and out of government who think that uh, you know building up the military, being a great power, yeah, that's all great, but everybody knows you've got to have economic wherewithal. You've got to have an economic base to do that. And that base has been eroding or certainly not in, uh, increasing or improving over the last uh, over the last few years, particularly since the uh, invasion of Ukraine. And so I think you'll see some things uh, happening. You and I have talked on another uh, conference, Tom, about, uh, about something that we both, I think, recognize which is the young intelligence officers and others who are coming up through the system who are very hard to read because they're keeping their heads down for obvious reasons in this, uh, in this situation. Um, I've had friends uh, who told me that, uh, you know, don't be surprised. You won't know this until it actually happens. But there's a lot of people who have some other views coming up in the security services who don't necessarily agree with the more hardline group of the current uh, Siloviki leadership. Um, and then there's, of course, all the economists. There are other uh, regional politicians. Uh, we tried when I was there to try to get to meet as many of these people as possible. But of course, it's getting, it's even harder now with the, the downturn in the relationship, redu reduction of our staff at the embassy and the inability of our ambassador to get out and do things. COVID was part of it, but I think the this isolation that uh, we've both talked about is also uh, hurting it. So it's hard to, to get an, a more precise read than that, I would say. Yeah, let me turn to you, Fiona, and, and, and ask a bit about Putin's own future uh, and the chances of his departure from the, um, from the Russian political scene. You know, we know from the constitutional amendments, mm -hmm. uh, he could serve out to 2036. Yep. Probably change it again and serve even longer. Uh, but you know, over the past year, we've also seen uh, a lot of indications that his, his grip on power is not as firm as it used to be. Um, the Navalny case, for example, and those demonstrations, which as John has uh, suggested, brought out a lot of young people in particular have used these new uh, technologies that we have and sort of to galvanize <clears throat> dissent and opposition across the country. Um, you know, we've seen a fall in uh, Putin's trust ratings dramatically over the past uh, couple of years, I would argue. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a question uh, that I at least we ought to explore is one, whether he indeed would uh, stand for re-election in 2024. Uh, and then something that's followed on uh, from what John has said, uh, when you look at this situation, uh, do you think it's more likely than not that Putin himself will decide when he leaves when it's time for him to leave power, uh, or is there a possibility, uh, given the nature of what's happening inside Russia within the elites, uh, that at some point he will be asked to leave uh, by a powerful coalition of, uh, of forces inside Russia? Well, I think, Tom, that everything that Putin has been doing 
and you know, obviously the real loyalist to him around him has been to try to preclude the latter part of your question, the idea that he will be asked to leave. Because it's very clear that Putin wants to leave on his own terms. And I would suggest that the amendments to the constitution and, uh, are less about whether he really wants to stay in power till 2036, by which time he'll be well into his 80s. And he's making fun so much of President Biden being you know, kind of close to 80. <laughs> Uh, that might suggest that, you know, can he probably doesn't really want to have that done to him later. And we all remember back in uh, 2011, 2012, when he returned to the presidency and there was all of the protests on Bolotnaya, you might um, recall, I mean, we'll certainly recall, but, you know, people in the audience might recall as well. There was a picture of Putin that was um, spread around where he was morphed into the um, image of Brezhnev making it extraordinarily clear that even then at the far younger age, you know, 10 years ago than he was then, uh, uh, you know, only, only merely in his 50s, that, um, you know, there was this idea of stagnation, gerontocracy, you know, the guy who would stay there until he literally just dropped off the mausoleum during, you know, one of the May Day celebrations and then, you know, ended up behind it in the Kremlin wall. You know, so this is not the idea of, of uh, for Putin to have this kind of image of him morph into, you know, kind of an aging tyrant, you know, kind of festooned with medals and just kind of doddering around. I mean, he wants to still be seen as the kind of vibrant action man. It's been difficult during the pandemic to get out there and do things. You know, we recently saw him pop up again out in you know, the wilds of Siberia, all decked out in sheepskin with... Um, you know, Shoigu, uh, the defense minister, who he likes to pop up with, you know, doing manly things at different times, you know, basically saying, look, there's all these rumors about me having Parkinson's, there's rumors that I'm not well, you know, there's rumors that I'm hiding, no, I'm not, here I am. But I mean, obviously he had to be careful uh, during the pandemic not to get sick. So, you know, and, you know, heaven forbid that what would happen to him, like happen to Boris Johnson in the UK, for example, because that all feeds into this whole risk that he's put himself in. He becomes the wild card, his health is the wild card. If he dies, you know, it throws all of these kind of questions into sharp relief. So, you know, he, he has to take care of himself for the system, not just for his own ability to shape what comes next. So this is, you know, kind of the whole issue about 2024. 2024, which was going to be the expiration date for his current sort of presidential terms, is also the 100th anniversary of the death of Vladimir Lenin. Uh, you know, the founder of the Soviet system. And Lenin, you know, of course, died somewhat prematurely, partly as a result of having been shot in an assassination attempt, you know, earlier on. And, you know, then you know, having a series of strokes, you know, not a great way to end. Uh, and, you know, Stalin, you know, comes after him, you know, obviously the death of Stalin, the movie, as well as the actual um, events itself. That, you know, is not something that Putin wants to contemplate. 2024 was bringing out all of these kind of questions, whether he was the political dead man, the lame duck. What was he going to do? You know, as you said, how was he going to protect himself? Was he going to become pre uh, president emeritus, you know, doing like what Nazarbayev has done or Lee Kuan Yew in um, Singapore? Would that be safe? You, you couldn't imagine him, you know, going off to a dacha and, you know, Pedidelkin or something, you know, like him doing a crush off. And in fact, you know, Navalny has now busted out the, the, the dacha, the giant, huge, enormous palace that boggles the imagination down on the Black Sea, not far from, you know, Krasnodar. You know, now that looks kind of, you know, a little bit off the picture because Navalny's kind of blown it all open. But it's also very clear because of the imprisonment of Navalny that Putin's running scared. The idea that somebody else is saying, you know, Navalny said, he, I wouldn't mind being president. And he's been uh, pushing a movement from the outside that, you know, would suggest that, um, you know, others would like to have a say as uh, Ambassador Tefn, as you've said, you know, there's plenty of other people who'd like to get in the mix, rise up uh, the um, career ladder and they're being bottled up by Putin and his guys, you know, standing on top of it right now. So Putin's trying to preclude someone like Navalny or an opposition um, movement saying when he should leave and how he should be succeeded. And he's also trying to preclude the guys who come and tap him on the, um, the shoulder and say, Vladimir Vladimirovich, you've had a good run of it, but you're not in command anymore. You know, either not well, or you can't, you know, control the opposition outside. You can't control the streets. You know, we need you to we need you to to move on. So he's trying. Everything points to the fact that he's trying to do his own operation successor. He's trying to do it on his terms, not on the terms of a constitutional mandate. And he, he doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be there till 2036. But it all then depends on him having the wherewithal to do that. And I also think that that's one of the reasons why he has to rail against the United States. 
because although we would like to stabilize the relationship, we would really like this all to go away. We don't want to be in a, a permanent confrontation. I mean, all of the presidents that we've served, none of them have wanted to do anything, anything other than either shift the relationship around, reset it, or just stabilize it. Just let it, you know, kind of fade to gray, please, so that we can move on with all the other things that we've got to do. I don't think Putin can afford that because it's also a mobilizing factor. And it's also something that justifies why he's there. The guy who came out of the Cold War to protect Russia against the pressure from the West, from NATO, from the United States. If NATO, the United States and the West just are not an issue, then what? You know, so that kind of organizing principle disappears and you need a new one. It can't be China. So, you know, what do you do? Why are you there still protecting the country? What are you protecting it from? And that, I think, is part of the dilemma. It's all about really what happens next to him and to the system around him. We'll come back to that. I think, you know, we ought to spend some time talking to policy issues. We've talked sort of the context at this point. Uh, and I want to start with you, John. Uh, and, and ask the, the first question of where you think Russia should rank in terms of U.S. foreign policy priorities at this point and why. You notice that you know, the last administration talked about China and Russia being sort of near, uh, near peer competitors. Yeah. The Biden administration uh, has clearly focused on China as the major strategic challenge. And you see that it's downgraded uh, Russia somewhat. It's a threat, it's a destabilizer. Uh, but no talk of them as a near to near peer competitor. So in your mind, where would you rank it? Uh, how much uh, time should the Biden administration be 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 devoting to Russia? Uh, I think it's a good question, Tom. I uh, uh, I can't argue that China, given all the things that are going on uh, in China and the, its relationship with the rest of the world, that that shouldn't be number one. But I've always felt that Russia should be higher up on the on the uh, the list, uh, and I I suspect that uh, part of the president's our president's calculus in proposing the summit meeting with uh, Putin very early on was a recognition that we have to address Russia. We if we ignore them, uh, we're only going to get into even more of a uh, of a box. And in some ways, the 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 Russian military maneuvers around Ukraine were kind of a reminder uh, from Putin, you know, you've got to take me uh, seriously. You can't just ignore me. Um, I remember when I was in Moscow, I don't think anything annoyed Putin and his people more than the statement that President Obama made after the, uh, after the Ukraine invasion, where he said, uh, this is just a regional power with nuclear weapons. Uh, that just went right to the to the soul of what they were trying to do. So I think what the president, our president, is trying to do is to recognize that uh, that this is a serious threat. We can't just put it out. It is an existential threat. They still have all these nuclear weapons. Uh, they can do what the Chinese can't do yet, at least, which is to destroy our country with nuclear weapons. And as we've seen over the years, they have ways to. Uh, through cyber and others to deeply impact our our society. Uh, and there are people, whether it's the government involved or not, who obviously are having a, a big impact even on our economy. Where I live here in, uh, in Virginia, there's gas stations running out of gas today because people are panicking over the uh, inability uh, of the uh, colonial system to get gas to the gas stations because people are, are running it up. Now, that's, I think, Russian uh, hackers who have done that. But still, Russia is a serious, is a serious threat in that sense uh, to our own economy, given the globalized uh, nature of all this. Now, let me sort of pull these two things together. I want to turn uh, to you, Fiona. Um, you know, uh, John has, I think, made a good argument of why Russia should figure sort of high in American uh, uh, foreign policy priorities. You just made an argument that with Putin uh, and his need to mobilize uh, the population, uh, that he's pursuing a fairly anti-U.S. policy at this point. So that raises the natural question, I think, of uh, what can the Biden administration hope to accomplish positively in this relationship uh, over the over the next four years? And that brings me back to some of the things that you said at the beginning: uh, areas, pandemic. Uh, climate change and others, where uh, logically there ought to be uh, uh, grounds for uh, common efforts and so forth. 
if you're sitting in the White House now looking forward, what do you think you can accomplish in four years uh, that will be positive from the standpoint of U.S. national interest and may also improve the, uh, the character of, of U.S.-Russian relations? I left myself muted there, sorry. Um, I think you just summed it up there, Tom. I mean, for anybody sitting in any White House, whether it was the last one, the one before, I mean, you and I have both been in them and um, obviously Ambassador Teft has sat there in Moscow trying to think the same thing. I mean, honestly, our options are quite limited. Um, we we'll just be pretty frank about it because while we're in a uh, situation where from um, Putin's perspective and those around him, that they don't really want to drop the confrontation, it makes it, you know, difficult for us to pursue any kind of meaningful engagement that would really change the situation. It's not to say that it's impossible, but it would require some different thinking on the part of uh, the Russians. And, you know, we've already seen that when um, the Biden administration has tried to kind of talk about stabilizing the relationship, which is language I used during the last, you know, administration as well, um, the, you know, we've had a response from Lavrov and Putin and others kind of somehow suggesting that, you know, we're trying to make Russia bow to our, you know, writ, uh, to our fiat and, you know, in some way when we're just saying, look, hey, let's try to find a, a modus vivendi and operandi here that isn't, you know, uh, just as heading into a massive confrontation over everything all the time, because we, you know, we clearly don't want to risk an escalation of any kind of confrontation in any of the hotspots uh, that seem to be in the relationship that would take us in any kind of military direction. You know, and as um, Ambassador Teft um, was making clear earlier, all of the maneuvering of the militaries uh, around the perimeter of Ukraine, uh, be it in the Crimea uh, peninsula or on you know, the border between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine and the Donbass region, that was all you know, very much clear signaling of, you know, an intent to use those military forces if Russia deems it necessary and, you know, kind of almost a dare to us, you know, to try to sort of do something in response and to the Ukrainians as well. So, you know, we should be under no illusions about uh, the fact that, you know, kind of Russia sees this whole thing, you know, quite differently. But again, there are areas where we can um, make some progress and where, we, in fact, we need to. I mean, on the pandemic, it's not going away. We're, we're in, you know, kind of we're doing okay with our vaccination and, you know, I hope we do better over the next coming months, but we've got a whole world out there to vaccinate. And Sputnik vaccine is part of that global program. They're having production problems and obviously some quality problems again uh, as well, based on uh, some of the reports that we've had, you know, we could all help them uh, with the production. I mean, just like some of the uh, US pharmaceutical companies who hadn't had a vaccine breakthrough have, you know, agreed to make the Pfizer or AstraZeneca, you know, vaccine for, why, why not? Why not contemplate this? You know, we did this during the Cold War. And, you know, okay, we've got vaccine diplomacy and clearly the Russians have shot themselves in the foot as well by engaging in propaganda that talked down all the Western vaccines and it's actually uh, put off a lot of Russians from getting vaccinated. So look, let, let's come on, let's find a way of getting, um, you know, uh, into, our, into a different space on this. Same with climate change. There are huge problems. And as Ambassador Teft already alluded to, Russia is going to have a real economic problem in the future. If, if I were the Russians, I'd start exporting green technology and, you know, kind of moving away from the reliance on hydrocarbons because your economic picture is going to look very different if the Europeans, the US and everybody else, even the Chinese start to move away from, you know, gas and oil uh, in the future. You know, the, the, how you know, much more time do they have to base the pillars of their economy on oil and gas, you know, for example? Okay, probably, you know, quite some time, but the world is moving and is going to have to move in a different trajectory. So there's going to be areas in which Russia is going to have to rethink. And so, you know, how can we work with them to push them in that direction? The problem is we're going to always have to be realistic about this because there is more of an incentive, I fear, for Putin and those around him to keep on trying to clobber the United States be it through cyber attacks or you know, uh, proxy forces or anything like this than there is to change at the moment. And again, I think that it's really gonna be China and how the world comes out of the pandemic that might shift Russia's calculus rather than us. Because if China really comes out as the unassailable global power out of all of this, being China's little buddy, a little kind of second player is going to be very uncomfortable. Russia didn't like it with the United States 
And China's, uh, as um, Ambassador Teft alluded as well, moving pretty fast on the strategic nuclear arsenal front. And we, the United States, have been proposing to Russia again, doing something more on arms control in the next phase, because the next phase isn't just about us in Russia, it's about all of us in the world, China and every other nuclear power, and want to be nuclear power that's out there, which is an increasing number. And so, you know, what do we do? We're not suggesting perhaps that Russia should be pitted against China, which frankly was what the Trump administration wanted to do. They wanted to pull Russia over into an anti-China coalition and Russia you know, didn't want anything to do with that. But, you know, kind of Russia may want some, as some Russian analysts have said, strategic autonomy, a bit of a pulling back from its close embrace with China. So, you know, how could we facilitate that in the future? I just think the thing is difficult, very difficult to manage. Okay, one final question. I, I want, um, uh, we've been just talking now for about uh, 40 minutes. So I want to turn to the, uh, the questions pretty soon. So one final question for both of you. If you could answer it in about 30 seconds, it would be great. We may have a summit coming up um, mm -hmm. in the middle of June. John, if you were wearing your old hat sitting in Moscow and you're drafting that scene setter back to Washington, what's the main point that you want to get across to, the, to President Biden? I think I would say uh, three things. This is an opportunity, obviously, for him to sit down face to face with Putin, which he hasn't done in a long time, to get an understanding uh, and to convey not only American priorities and American red lines, but to hear what Putin has to say about those. I think in terms of what uh, we always call deliverables in the government, uh, the best uh, I could, what I would focus on would be to get uh, some nuclear, uh, the follow-on nuclear uh, weapon arms control talk started. Uh, if there's ways to do things uh, in the health area, in COVID, that's fine. Climate change, uh, the Arctic, next month uh, is the meeting in uh, Reykjavik. Russia the Arctic Council. There may be possibilities uh, to do that, even as we disagree on the whole range of issues that we all know about. Okay, and now to you, Fonis. You know, sitting in your old, uh, old position with a new president granted, um, you're writing that memo about the, the meeting. Not what should you accomplish, but what are you going to tell uh, President Biden about the traps he needs to be aware of and he needs to avoid in his meeting with Putin? Oh, oh gosh, there are so many of those. <clears throat> First of all, make sure you have a good note taker. <laughs> not just not don't meet one and one with uh, just the translator and leave it to the poor translator to have to you know, fend for themselves afterwards. Uh, make sure that, you know, obviously it's pretty well structured and also, you know, giving shades of heart attacks that I had during the Helsinki uh, summit meeting, um, be very careful about press conferences. And it's not just about what you say, but it's what Putin will do to use that for some grandstanding or putting some traps out. So I would be very careful about um, uh, reducing expectations of accomplishments for one thing, because of course there will be a lot of people who won't want President Biden to meet with President um, Putin here, because of this worry that we're somehow appeasing or, you know, kind of, in other words, giving them a gift by having this kind of meeting, because of course Putin does want to be seen in the spotlight <clears throat> with the US president, because it reflects well at home as well as internationally to emphasize that, as Ambassador Tef said, they're not a regional player, but they're a global player and that Putin is an international statesman. But we have to be, be very careful to make sure that um, uh, President Biden isn't lured into any trap because we've seen that over and over again, that Putin will dangle something out there to somehow you know, spoil the whole um, you know, um, direct uh, intersect of interactions. So I would minimize press conferences and, and statements and be extraordinarily you know, clear that the goals of uh, this meeting are just as Ambassador Teff laid out, to have an exchange of frank views, hear each side out, focus on a couple of things you can achieve, and that's it. Right, so no press conferences ought to be the, the slogan going into Yeah, the I'm sure that there will be one, but anyway, or I would have a well, statement and just kind of, you know, minimize the risk. You know, uh, during the Cold War, we didn't do joint press conferences. Well, there you are then. And so there's a there's a there's a precedent. There's a precedent for adversarial <laughs> relations and not doing um, press conferences. Let me turn to the questions now. Uh, I've got a first one uh, on uh, actually on Kosovo and Serbia in an ongoing dialogue. Um, uh, you know that could eventually lead to recognition of Kosovo and UN membership. And so the question is. 
um, to what extent uh, could we reach U.S.-Russian agreement uh, that this is a good thing uh, so that Russia would not, black, would not block Kosovo's membership in the United Nations? Um, either one of you want to take a shot at that? Well, we did actually try that um, under the last administration to see if there could be some comity with the Russians on this. And it wasn't obvious that there would be. However, um, you know, there's also other players in the Balkans, like uh, China and Turkey. So there could be a way of, you know, presenting this of, you know, kind of Russia, you know, being supportive, not just of Serbia and Kosovo and, you know, retaining, you know, some kind of influence in the Balkans by being a more positive player. I mean, there's not a great deal of indication that that would be particularly appealing. Um, you know, is there some way of Russia getting credit for this? You know, is usually kind of because we saw in the case of North Macedonia and Greece that Russia was in, in fact willing to spoil its relationships with Greece by trying to, you know, stick a wrench in the works um, at the last moment on the North Macedonia naming issue. <clears throat> and, you know, was playing around with, um, uh, you know, kind of this in the 12th hour. And, you know, so far, Russia has seemed to be more interested in maintaining a kind of a bit of a grip over Serbia and trying to see how it could kind of leverage that issue rather than solving it. But, you know, it's not beyond the realm of impossible that it could be presented to Russia that this is actually a beneficial rather than negative, you know, especially if, you know, it looks like keeping uh, the differences between Kosovo and Serbia would allow others you know, to play that may not be, you know, always in, in Russia's favor. It's complicated, I think, because we did go around that, trying to, trying to present this to the Russians as a possible thing we could go, do together the last time around. And, you know, it wasn't very clear that they were particularly interested in playing ball on that one. Um, let me turn to you, John. I got a question from uh, Mark Tokola, uh, and it's basically about, about um, Russia and China. You know, we seem to be uh, uh, pushing Russia and China together. Uh, at this point, is there anything that we could do that would drive those two countries apart? Yeah, I've thought about this, and I've been on a number of web conferences where experts far more, far better than me have uh, talked about this. And I frankly don't see that there's much in the short term that we can, the issues as we've talked about, will help. But I think there's this understanding uh, between Putin and Xi, which will make that hard. You know, uh, when you go back and look at Henry Kissinger's efforts to uh, uh, to try to divide the Chinese from the Russians, that was in a period when when the Russians and the Chinese uh, they'd just come off a a, a war uh, or some fighting at least along the Amur River in 1969. Mm. Right now, if anything, moving closer together to try to uh, uh, to find some common ground. Um, I'm not sure that uh, that there's much we can do specifically to try to do that, but I think engaging with Russia and, you know, frankly, I think Fiona mentioned this, there's a lot of people inside Russia in the official circles who uh, are worried that Russia is increasingly becoming the junior partner in this relationship with Beijing. And, uh, you know, I remember even before I left Moscow in 2017, I would hear that from people. I would ask questions, are you comfortable with giving Russia uh, S-400 uh, missile technology, their best ground air interceptor. Mm -hmm. And uh, people would wring their hands in private about that. So, you know, I think the, we have to just keep steady on this. Um, I don't have a, a magic bullet, uh, as it were. Maybe that's a bad metaphor. <laughs> Let me uh, go to you, uh, Fiona, with another question. And you can touch on this one if you want to. It's from Peter Clement, uh, who asked, uh, you know, what has the impact been of uh, U.S. and Western sanctions on Russia? Uh, and in addition, uh, how important is Nord Stream 2 uh, for the Russians at this point? Well, the sanctions have uh, really inflicted a lot of economic pain. Obviously, you know, Russia continues to keep adjusting to them. The personal sanctions have been seen as an affront. And, you know, I think that they're <clears throat> not something that um, obviously the... Um, Putin uh, government and regime wants to continue and they're trying everything that they can to have some of those lifted. And they do seem to be you know, pretty keen on avoiding more of them. And I do think that, you know, sanctions did have an impact when we were unified with Europe, certainly in rolling back Russia's goals in Ukraine when they're 
after sparking off the conflict in Donbass, they wanted to clearly move on, you know, through um, Ukrainian territory and sort of further down beyond the Donetsk and Lukansk regions, you know, to try to sort of consolidate um, <clears throat> some kind of grip on that southern part of Ukraine moving down to Crimea. I think that those kind of ambitions were pushed back because of a very strong response, which of course came after MH17. I mean, I think it's when we do something unified, whether it's sanctions or any other actions <clears throat> in lockstep with our European allies, that Russia does take stock and you know does pay attention. Now, in terms of Nord Stream 2, it's just it's become highly symbolic uh, for Russia as well. It's and I and I think you know that we actually may have overplayed this. It's become totemic. Uh, in, in the sense that there was all kinds of other things that we could do. And, you know, kind of Nord Stream 2 has become, in my view, honestly, one of those hills during World War I, where an awful lot of people, you know, kind of uh, are killed, you know, sort of trying to take a hump in the middle of a field. Uh, my grandfather fought uh, during World War you know, One, and, you know, described the same things of kind of going over a trench and, you know, basically trying to kind of push uh, forces, uh, opposing forces around, you know, a very small territory for a very minimal gain. Now, obviously, you know, Nord Stream 2 is significant in terms of consolidating uh, Russia's dominance in, uh, in European energy. But, you know, as we've all talked about, Russian uh, and European energy perspectives are changing. And, you know, it's not entirely clear that Nord Stream 2 will become the major, you know, sort of dominant pipeline that the aspiration is there if there's more diversification of uh, European energy markets and if there's a move away from hydrocarbons to more renewable uh, fuels. And there was also an opportunity to do something very different for Ukraine, because over the longer term, it's not good for Ukraine and Ukraine's economic future to be dependent on transit fees from Russian gas going through Ukrainian territory. So Nord Stream 2 is just one battle in or one you know, point in a larger battle or a larger, um, let's just say campaign and program to diversify European energy and to you know, change the perspective of Ukraine and Ukraine's economic future. So I just kind of fear that, again, Nord Stream 2 has become so symbolic that you know, kind of it's become a big issue for uh, Russia, uh, a big issue for Germany, and a big issue for the United States. It's also become a real spoiler in US-German relations. And under the last administration, the fixation on Nord Stream 2 was more about Germany and Germany's perspective on Russia and Germany's perspective on NATO than it was about Russia itself. So I, I, again, I, I would just sort of caution all of us to not have Nord Stream 2 to be the only hill that we all want to die on. Because, you know, kind of one way or another, it'll either get stopped, it won't get stopped, but it won't be the culmination of the whole issue that we're trying to talk about. Okay, uh, John, I'm gonna to turn to you, and this is a question from Richard Howe, sort of um, built off some of the uh, things that Fiona has just said. Um, and you know, Richard House says, uh, you know, he's heard that the oligarchs are propping up Putin. Uh, and so the question is, um, how likely are the oligarchs to decide that Putin should be removed? Uh, and what would the United States or what could the United States do to prevent or to persuade them that it's time for Putin to go? I just don't see that that's likely to happen anytime soon. I mean, unless things have changed since I was in Moscow and used to talk to a bunch of these guys, uh, you know, Putin effectively uh, uh, contained and managed the oligarchs. The whole Hordorkovsky case and everything was a very clear uh, signal to them about that if they wanted to prosper, they had to do it within the Putin system. And I think that still uh, remains uh, the case. Now, are they privately dissatisfied with some of the things going on? I'm sure they are, but I don't see them in the short term uh, rising up against Vladimir Putin. Um, I think that uh, they're, they're probably frustrated over the lack of investment and their inability or their pressure on them to do certain things. Uh, we saw Mr. Deripaska pressured to do things in uh, with regard to Montenegro, uh, but I don't see them becoming a, a force uh, on their own uh, to try to change uh, the political situation. And um, uh, I'm not sure that there's much that he can do to really uh, to change that uh, situation. Okay. I this one is for both of you, and if you can take a stab at it. Uh, we had a number of questions that, that relate to the former Soviet space. Um, and so, you know, what could the United States do, for example, 
to be more supportive of Ukraine at this point? Uh, how should the United States be thinking about um, the situation in Belarus and what should we be doing there? Um, similar question for um, you know, the, the caucuses, particularly growing out of the conflict that we've just seen in, uh, Nagor in and around nagorno karabakh So if you were advising President Biden at this point, how would you uh, recommend that he approach these issues in the former Soviet space? Let me start with you, John, and I'll go to Fiona. I think that if you look at Ukraine, I think getting Tony Blinken out there was, uh, was a, a significant thing to do. Um, I hope it's in getting the vice, getting President Biden to, to talk to Zelensky, I think was, uh, it was delayed too long. I would have done it earlier. But uh, I think that uh, the things that Tony talked about when he was there about providing additional uh, security assistance, the money I think has already been allocated, uh, that sends a, a pretty clear message of support for Ukraine. And it also shows uh, a continuity in American policy toward Ukraine, which uh, the Russians, I'm sure, have, uh, have looked at. Um, fundamentally, the issue in Ukraine is, I think, again, what Tony focused on, which is you've got to build a democracy and a more open uh, economic system. You've got to stop uh, some of these oligarchs from uh, uh, undermining uh, the economic system, corrupting the system in those societies. With regard to Georgia, uh, I think that, uh, from what I can tell at least, that uh, the EU has done a pretty good job, supported by us and our ambassador in uh, in Tbilisi, Kelly Degnan has been very active uh, behind the scenes, uh, trying to get them to resolve this government crisis, uh, to try to build a more, uh, not only a, uh, a build a better democracy, but to build a more effective democracy, to get the political parties to recognize that their future is solving problems together. They can fight uh, as much as they want, but they have to be able politically, but they have to work together for the common good of the country. Uh, this has been a problem or this has been a, an approach from multiple genera uh, multiple administrations. And I think uh, pushing that in Ukraine and in Georgia uh, is going to be a critical uh, factor. Uh, I know Belarus less. Uh, it seems that Russia is trying to, in effect, buy as much of Belarus as it possibly can. But uh, we've seen the, the people on the streets and the continuity of the protest that's continued there. And uh, I think this is something where I see this kind of national pride, national upper, uh, feeling uh, swelling in, uh, in Belarus now, as it did before in uh, Ukraine and in Georgia. And uh, Russia's on the wrong side of history on this one, and they're going to have to eventually accommodate it. They can't just put it back in the box and say, you are part of our sphere of influence and, do, and we'll do what we say. Fiona. Let me ask actually a different question. I got one final question for both of you. Uh, and that is, if you could recommend two or three works on Russia that would help um, uh, the people out there understand the nature of Russian politics and Russian foreign policy, what would they be? So in 30 seconds, give me, give me a few titles. My, mine are always history books. And, uh, you know, my, my very favorite is really, you know, kind of an, an article by my old professor at Harvard, um, Ned Keenan, uh, Moscovite, um, you know, historical folkways or pathways. Now I've mangled the title and everyone will be like trying to look that one up. But I mean, I know Tom, that, um, so it's, a, it's a great short read because there's so much continuity in the, you know, the political culture you know, of Russia that, you know, going back to the, you know, the history books, um, you know, Pipes's book, Russia Under the Old Regime, you know, for example, you know, describing the way that the, you know, Russian empire was structured is also extraordinarily helpful in his book on the formation of the Soviet Union. I always find that those earlier history books, you know, kind of really give you a shape. And you also have to remember that's what Vladimir Putin reads, not Pipes and probably or Ned Keenan's article, but he also goes back and reads Russian history books, Lamanosov, you know, the kind of the, the, the big history um, uh, of Russia, because Russians are steeped in their history. Uh, and, you know, maybe the younger generation, you know, perhaps a bit less so, we'll have to find out, but people like Putin are living in that history and are always kind of bringing it forward their interpretations. The title is Muscovite Political Folkways. Yeah, so I was right, the Muscovite. The yeah. Russian Review. John. The Russian Review, exactly. Title. Yeah, the book I recommend to everybody uh, is Arkady Ostrovsky's The Invention of Russia from uh, Gorbachev's Peace right to Putin. It's a tremendous book to give you some 
context, the undercurrent among Russian intellectuals, particularly since the 1960s to the present. And it's very good at trying to understand what Gorbachev was trying to do and what Putin was trying to do. Uh, it's, a, it's an easy read. Ostrovsky is the Russia editor of The Economist before that work for the Financial Times. He's originally from Russia, was a drama student who went to Cambridge and uh, then went into it's a, it's, a, it's a really good read. The other one to read is uh, Fiona uh, Hill's uh, uh, multiple <laughs> works on himself. I'm, not, I'm serious. I, would, I say this to other people, Fiona, not just because you're on here. But uh, uh, I thought your testimony, I can't remember, you've probably done some more recently, but I think it was 2016. Uh, it's still a, a really a masterpiece of understanding Putin and Russia uh, at the beginning of the Trump administration. A lot of that stayed the same. Well, we have exhausted our time. Um, we haven't exhausted all the questions. I hope we haven't exhausted the patience of everybody who's listening. But I want to thank the two of you, for, I think, for a very uh, lively, insightful discussion. Obviously, this is not a question that is going to go away. Uh, the riddle of Russia is here forever. So uh, we we'll hope to see you again at a webinar. Thank you very much. Susan? Yeah, and thanks to all of you. I just second what Tom said, the riddle of Russia is not going away. So I hope we can continue this discussion at a later time. And thanks to all three of you, Fiona, John, and Tom for a, a great hour of discussion. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.